Private James Cooper was on a routine night patrol in the Sonoran Desert of Southern Arizona. It was September 23, 2015, and his unit was conducting training exercises near the Barry M. Goldwater Air Force Range. The air was still warm from the day's heat, with temperatures hovering around 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 29 degrees Celsius, even at 11.30 p.m. A half moon hung in the clear sky, providing some natural illumination to supplement the soldier's night vision equipment. Cooper, a 22-year-old from Lansing, Michigan, had been in the Army for just over a year, driven by a desire to serve his country and see more of the world. The desert environment was a far cry from the lush forests and great lakes of his home state, and he was still adjusting to the landscape. As he moved cautiously through the desert terrain, Cooper's night vision goggles illuminated the world in shades of green. The exercise had been uneventful so far, consisting mainly of long hours of walking and observing. His unit was practicing long-range reconnaissance and surveillance techniques, skills that were crucial for modern warfare scenarios. The Sonoran Desert, known for its diverse ecosystem, stretched out around him. Saguaro cacti stood all around him, their distinctive shapes creating eerie shadows in the moonlight. Patches of creosote bushes and ironwood trees dotted the landscape, providing potential cover for wildlife or for the opposing force in their training exercise. Cooper was well aware of the desert's inhabitants. During their briefing, they had been warned about the various animals they might encounter, coyotes, javelinas, and even the elusive mountain lion. They had also been cautioned about the desert's other dangers, scorpions, rattlesnakes, and the risk of dehydration in the arid climate. At approximately 1.15 a.m., Cooper heard an unusual sound about 100 meters ahead. He paused, his muscles tensing as he strained to identify the noise. It could have been another soldier from his unit. They were spread out over a wide area, someone from the opposing force, or perhaps a desert animal. But the sound was unlike anything he'd heard before. Not quite a growl, not quite a hiss, but something in between. As he stood still, listening intently, the noise grew louder. It sounded like something large moving through the sparse vegetation, but with an odd shuffling quality that didn't match any animal movement Cooper was familiar with. He raised his rifle, more out of training than any real sense of threat, and slowly began to move towards the source of the sound. The terrain here was slightly elevated, with a gentle slope leading up to a cluster of large rocks and saguaros. Cooper moved carefully, placing each foot deliberately to avoid making noise on the gravelly soil. As he approached the top of the small rise, the strange sound suddenly stopped. Cooper stopped to listen, his senses on high alert. The desert night, which had been filled with the subtle sounds of wind and distant animal calls, now seemed unnaturally quiet. He waited, barely breathing. Suddenly, a dark shape emerged from behind a large saguaro, about 50 meters away. As he focused on the figure, Adjusting the focus on his night vision goggles, he realized it was something he had never seen before. The creature stood upright, easily eight feet tall. Its body seemed to shimmer slightly in Cooper's vision, as if it wasn't quite solid or was somehow interfering with his night vision equipment. The arms were extraordinarily long, hanging almost to the ground, and its head was oddly elongated, almost bullet-shaped. Cooper felt his heart rate spike, the rush of adrenaline making his fingers tingle where they rested on his rifle. He wanted to radio for backup, but he was momentarily paralyzed by shock, unable to take his eyes off the creature. It seemed to be scanning the area, its head moving in an unnaturally smooth motion that reminded Cooper of the targeting systems on some of the military drones he'd seen. Then, without warning, it turned and looked directly at Cooper. In the green glow of his night vision, he could see two large, reflective eyes locked onto him, glowing with an inner light that his night vision goggles seemed to struggle to process. Cooper tried to understand what he was seeing. Was this some kind of new military technology being tested? Was he being tested? Or was this some unknown desert creature? Then, suddenly, the being seemed to shimmer more intensely. Cooper blinked, and in that instant the creature vanished. One moment it was there, the next, it was gone. 
with no sign of movement or disturbance in the surrounding vegetation. Cooper was now very aware that his breath was coming in short gasps. He swept his rifle back and forth, searching for any further sign of the creature, but there was nothing. The desert night had returned to its normal state, with the faint calls of nocturnal animals resuming in the distance. Finally finding his voice, Cooper keyed his radio with a shaking hand. This is Cooper, he said, his voice cracking slightly. I need, I need a sit rep, over. He didn't know how to explain what he'd just seen, but he knew he needed to report something. Cooper, this is Sergeant Mills. What's your status? Over. Cooper took a deep breath, trying to steady himself. I've encountered something. I can't explain it. Request immediate backup at my position. Over. There was a pause before the radio crackled to life again. Copy that, Cooper. Stay put. We're on our way. Out. As he waited for his unit to arrive, Cooper kept his rifle ready, scanning the area continuously. When his unit arrived at his position a few minutes later, they found Cooper visibly shaken. As he tried to explain what he had seen, they spread out to search the area. In the sandy soil near where the creature had stood, they found large, unusual impressions. The marks were over 20 inches long and showed no clear foot or paw structure. The incident was reported up the chain of command, but no official explanation was ever provided. Some speculated it might have been a mirage or a malfunction of the night vision equipment. To this day, the encounter has played in his mind countless times, with him trying to make sense of it. He was left wondering what exactly he had encountered in the Sonoran Desert that night. He realizes that he may never know the full truth, but hopefully someone here can offer up suggestions that will help alleviate the frustration he's experiencing. I recently received the following account from a man who I will call John to protect his identity. Together, he and I have changed details of his story to help keep him safe. John reached out to share an experience that has haunted him since the summer of 2018. With a solid background in engineering, John has spent years working with several government contractors. His story begins when he was assigned to a project at a remote military base in the southwestern United States. This base was situated deep in the desert, surrounded by vast stretches of barren land and rugged mountains. It was a place of high security, where access was strictly limited to only those with top-level clearance. Initially, John's assignment seemed routine, he was brought in to work on a new communication system, a project he came to understand was crucial for national security. The work was challenging, involving cutting-edge technology and long hours, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. That was, until about a month into the project. One evening after working late, John was preparing to leave the facility when he noticed a convoy of black SUVs arriving at the base. While the presence of such vehicles wasn't entirely unusual, what stood out was a large, unmarked cargo truck accompanying them. Curious as to what was going on, John lingered in the parking lot, watching as the convoy made its way to a hangar at the far end of the base. The hangar was one of the most secure areas, rarely used, and always guarded. John had often wondered what was in the hangar. The following day, the atmosphere at the base had shifted noticeably. There was a significant increase in military personnel, and areas that were previously accessible were now off-limits. Colleagues whispered about a special project, but details were elusive. John had a very strong feeling that something of top security was happening behind the scenes. Security protocols were tightened, and there was an air of secrecy that was palpable. A week later, while conducting routine maintenance on the communication systems, John stumbled upon something that defied explanation. He had accessed a secure server to troubleshoot a connectivity issue when he noticed several files with cryptic code names that didn't match any known projects. Cautiously, he opened one of the files to check it. What he found left him stunned and completely in shock. The file contained high-resolution images of an object that appeared to be a craft of some sort, unlike anything he had ever seen in person. It was sleek, metallic, and bore no resemblance to any conventional aircraft. The design was otherworldly, with smooth curves and an iridescent surface 
that seemed like it would shift colors in the light. Alongside the images were documents detailing attempts to reverse engineer the technology. The language in the documents was technical, filled with jargon about propulsion systems and materials that seemed beyond current human capabilities. As he scrolled through the files, John came across a video clip. It was grainy and short, but unmistakable. The footage showed a small humanoid figure with large eyes and a slender frame being escorted by military personnel. The being moved with an eerie grace, and its presence was both fascinating and unsettling. The sight of the creature confirmed what John had begun to suspect. He had stumbled across governmental evidence of extraterrestrial life. Realizing the gravity of what he had discovered, John started feeling a bit fearful. He knew that mentioning it to anyone could jeopardize his career, or worse, his safety. The discovery weighed heavily on him, and he became hyper aware of his surroundings. He started noticing other odd occurrences around the base, strange lights in the sky at night, hushed conversations among the staff about visitors, and an ever-present feeling that he was being monitored. In the days that followed, John took extra precautions. He avoided discussing his findings with colleagues and ensured that his digital footprint remained minimal. Despite his efforts to maintain a low profile, he couldn't help but worry that they were on to him. There were moments when he felt eyes on him, even in the most mundane settings, like the cafeteria or during routine security checks. Then came the night that changed everything. John was working late again, the hum of machines and the flickering fluorescent lights creating a sterile environment. As he was packing up to leave, he decided to take a different route back to his car, one that led him past the restricted hangar. To his surprise, the door was slightly ajar, and a faint light spilled out into the corridor. Driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, John approached the door and peered inside. What he saw was shocking. The interior of the hangar was filled with advanced technology and several personnel in lab coats, all focused on a large object covered by a tarp. He could hear snippets of conversation, discussing the craft's capabilities and the implications of their findings. Then, as he stood watching, the tarp was pulled back, revealing the craft in its entirety. It was unlike anything he ever thought existed in real life. It was sleek and shimmering, with strange symbols etched into its surface. Suddenly, a noise behind him caused John to turn. He was met with the gaze of a figure, a tall man in uniform, who seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. The man's expression was stern, to say the least. And before John could react, he was firmly escorted away from the area. As they walked, the man remained silent, his grip on John's arm a clear indication that this was not a casual encounter. John was led to a small, dimly lit room within the base, a place he had never seen before. Inside, two other officials were waiting, both wearing the same stern expressions. The atmosphere was tense, and John could feel his heart pounding in his chest. He was asked to sit down, and the door was closed behind him with a decisive click. One of the officials, a woman with sharp features and an authoritative demeanor, began to speak. She informed John that what he had seen was not to be discussed with anyone. Her tone was firm but calm, and she emphasized the importance of keeping himself safe, her eyes locking onto John's. For your safety and the safety of others, you must remain silent about what you have seen. John was then presented with a non-disclosure agreement, a lengthy document filled with legal jargon. The implications were clear. Discussing any details of the incident could lead to severe consequences, both legally and personally. The officials made it clear that the government took such breaches very seriously and that they had the means to enforce these agreements. Feeling trapped and overwhelmed, John signed the document, understanding that he had little choice. The officials reiterated the importance of his silence and assured him that this was for the greater good. As he was escorted out of the room, John couldn't help but feel a bit of resignation. The reality of the situation was sinking in. He had witnessed something extraordinary, but he had no choice but to keep it a secret or find a way to share the information without giving himself up. In the days that followed, John returned to his work, trying to maintain a semblance of normalcy. He became more cautious, 
avoiding any discussions that might lead to the topic of the base or any of its projects. The experience had left him shaken, and he found himself becoming deeply anxious, constantly looking over his shoulder, wary of being watched. Despite the warnings and the agreement he had signed, John felt a growing sense of a need to talk to someone. He confided in a select few, trusted friends and family members, sharing his story in a way that helped him get through his day. Yet, he remained vigilant and careful, aware of the potential repercussions of him talking. To this day, John remains cautious about sharing his story publicly. He hopes that one day, the truth will come to light and that others will understand the significance of what he witnessed. Jake Hawkins, a 38-year-old geothermal technician, had been working in Yellowstone National Park for five years when the most shocking event of his life happened. His job involved monitoring and maintaining the park's extensive network of geothermal sensors, which provided crucial data on the activity in Yellowstone. On a chilly November evening in 2021, Jake was conducting a routine check of sensors in the Norris Geyser Basin, known for its volatile hot springs and geysers. Jake's work often required him to be in remote areas of the park during odd hours, as geothermal activity didn't adhere to a 9 to 5 schedule. He was well equipped for his task, carrying a ruggedized tablet for data collection, various tools for sensor maintenance, and safety gear for working around potentially dangerous geothermal features. At around 8.15 p.m., Jake arrived at a sensor station near one of the geyser. The area was dimly lit by the fading twilight and the glow from his headlamp. Steam rose from nearby hot springs, creating an otherworldly atmosphere in the gathering darkness. Jake began his routine, checking the sensor's physical condition and downloading the latest data to his tablet. As he worked, Jake noticed something unusual that stood out. About 30 yards away, near the edge of a small hot spring, he saw what appeared to be a large rock or boulder. This wasn't uncommon in the area, but something about this particular formation caught his attention. He didn't remember ever seeing it before, which was odd. Jake finished his work at the sensor station and decided to take a closer look at the rock formation. As he approached, he realized that what he had initially thought was a boulder was actually moving slightly. It seemed to be expanding and contracting, almost as if it were breathing. Intrigued and slightly unnerved, Jake moved closer, making sure to stay on the designated boardwalk. As he watched, the rock began to change shape. Its surface rippled and flowed like thick liquid, gradually morphing into a form that resembled a large bison. Jake blinked hard and rubbed his eyes, certain that the steam and poor lighting were playing tricks on him. But when he looked again, the transformation continued. The bison-like shape was now changing again, this time taking on the appearance of a tall, thin tree. Jake's heart raced as he tried to process what he was seeing. In his years working in Yellowstone, he had encountered many strange and beautiful natural phenomena, but nothing like this. He knew the park's geology and wildlife intimately, and this defied all logical explanation. Suddenly, the entity, Jake couldn't think of what else to call it, seemed to notice him. It stopped changing shape and remained in its tree-like form. Then, slowly, it began to move towards him. Jake's instincts told him to run, but his fascination kept him in place. As the entity approached, he could see that its bark was constantly shifting, like waves on a pond. It stopped about 10 feet from Jake, towering over him and swaying slowly back and forth. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, a branch-like appendage reached out towards Jake. In a panic, he stumbled backward, nearly falling off the boardwalk. The entity immediately retreated, its form rippling and changing once again, this time into something that looked like a large bird. With incredible speed, it took flight disappearing into the darkness beyond the reach of Jake's headlamp. Jake stood there for several minutes, his mind racing to make sense of what he had just witnessed. As a technician, he was trained to trust data and facts, but what he had just seen challenged all of that. Shaken but determined to document the experience, Jake pulled out his tablet 
and began recording every detail he could remember. He noted the time, location, weather conditions, and a thorough description of the entity's appearance and behavior. He also used his tablet to take photos of the area. The next morning, Jake returned to the site with a colleague, ostensibly to double-check the sensor readings. He searched for any physical evidence of the encounter, unusual tracks, residue, or disturbances in the area. However, he found nothing out of the ordinary. The site looked like any other part of the Norris Geyser Basin, with no indication of the strange events from the previous night. Jake debated whether to report his experience to the park rangers or his supervisors. He knew that such an outlandish claim could potentially damage his professional reputation and even jeopardize his job. Yet, he couldn't shake the feeling that what he had seen was real and potentially significant. In the following weeks, Jake discreetly asked his colleagues if they had ever encountered anything unusual during their work in the park. While some shared stories of strange sounds or unexplained equipment malfunctions, none had experienced anything close to what Jake had witnessed. As he continued his work in Yellowstone National Park, Jake kept a watchful eye on the geothermal areas, always wondering if he might once again encounter the inexplicable shape-shifting entity of the Norris Geyser Basin. He began to pay closer attention to local legends and Native American stories about the park, searching for any historical accounts that might shed light on his experience. Jake's encounter remained a mystery, leaving him with more questions than answers. He found himself torn between his scientific training and the undeniable reality of what he had witnessed. As he went about his daily tasks, monitoring the hidden forces beneath Yellowstone's surface, Jake couldn't help but wonder what other secrets the park might be hiding. 